Welcome to the Walled Garden Podcast. Here, we nourish the gardens of our minds, one meaningful conversation at a time. If you'd like to find out more, go to thewalledgarden.com. Thanks for joining us. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Walled Garden Podcast. So this week we have a repeat guest on the show, somebody who I've become very fond of as a classicist, a philosopher, a historian, uh, and a podcaster. His name is Jack Vizhnik, and he's the host of the Ancient Greece Declassified podcast. And if you haven't already listened to that show yet, I really have to recommend that you go over and check it out and uh, and have a listen to some of his episodes because Jack really has put such amazing effort into producing that podcast and creating a space for people to really get to understand that ancient world of, of Greece. And, uh, and so I've just been diving into some of his episodes lately, particularly listening to his episodes on Plato's Republic, which are extremely enlightening. And, uh, and just there's such a wealth of knowledge and understanding there that he, he puts into every single episode. So I really want to encourage you to go over and check out that podcast. Again, it's the Ancient Greece Declassified Podcast. So I'm going to read you a little bit about Jack, and then I want to tell you about a couple of events that we have coming up in the World Garden this week, and then we'll go from there. So Jack Vizhnik is a classicist and historian of philosophy interested in uncovering long-term patterns in history. He has a Bachelor in Classics and Mathematics from Columbia University and a PhD in Ancient Philosophy from Princeton. His book, The Invention of Duty, explores the origins of the notion of moral duty in Greco-Roman antiquity and claims that the Stoics were the originators of the term. In his podcast, Ancient Greece Declassified, as I've mentioned before, he brings modern scholarship on the ancient Mediterranean to a popular audience. So I've included a link in the show notes to where you can go to his website. It's called greasepodcast.com. Now, before we dive into the interview, I just want to tell you that this week we have a couple of events coming up in the World Garden. And the first event that we have is with the master herself, Sharon LaBelle. She's going to be talking with us about the importance of holiness, what it is and why do we need it. And uh, so really looking forward to that meetup. Sharon always delivers a phenomenal lesson and uh, it's always a great chance to pick her brain on these vital subjects for a meaningful life. Now, that's going to be coming up, uh, I don't know if I already mentioned this, uh, on the 12th of May or the 13th for us Australians. Uh, And so if you just go to thewalledgarden.com forward slash events, you can find the event there and you can register and also put the links in the show notes as well. And the next event that we have is on the very next day, which is the 13th for uh, the American side of the world and the 14th for over here. Uh, And so that's going to be with Dr. Megan McKellarin on empowering first aiders using stoicism. So uh, Dr. McKellarin was actually recommended to me by Ryan Driscoll from the Stoic Warfighters podcast. And she actually trains first responders using Stoic principles. And, uh, and so it's going to be a really fascinating conversation and interview and Q&A, uh, really just to pick her brain about how Stoicism is being used in these kind of emergency situations. Uh, and it won't be the first time that we've talked about this sort of stuff on the show, but uh, nonetheless, it's, it's going to be uh, really great to, to, to find out more from her about what she's doing in the field. It's so cool to see this philosophy finding its way into so many practical applications throughout the world. So anyway, go to thewalledgarden.com forward slash events, as I said earlier, and you can register for those events coming up this week, and we would really love to see you there. And with all that said, I'm going to finally dive into this interview. Without any further ado, I present to you Jack Vizhnik. (laughs) 
So obviously today we have Jack Vizhnik. I'm getting your name right. Yes. Is that heck yeah? Okay, awesome. But uh, you know, from from our first meeting, Jack, when we had our first conversation, uh, I was really impressed with the the depth to which you've you've studied uh, these ancient cultures, and uh, just really admire your passion. You know, when when you come across somebody who you're like, yeah, that person is doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing in life. It seems to me like you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing by geeking out about uh, ancient Greece and Rome. <laughs> and on that level, I I remember speaking with Kai once, and he was telling me about this study that he was doing. I can't remember whether it was with the Greeks or the Romans, but he was trying to figure out like exactly how much energy expenditure they had or how they got energy or something like that. And he was talking to me about this study, and I was like, you're an absolute psychopath, right? <laughs> but but that's why I'm so excited to get you both in this conversation today because Kai geeks out big time on uh, on ancient Rome and ancient Greece, and so do you, Jack. And so I'm just gonna throw it over to Kai to start this conversation. And honestly, I'm happy if I only ask like one or two questions in this conversation because we've already talked before. But I'm mostly excited to see what happens when you two get in the room. So, uh, Kai, take it away, man. Yeah, so that study, Jack, was uh, we were calculating how much illumination the Romans had in Pompeii and Herculaneum. So we looked at the flows of, of oil and some things to do with like policy. And yeah, some, we then calculated like the lighting in Georgia and London just before, just at the before electricity. And we found out that Romans had more light, or well, the Romans in Herculaneum and Pompeii had more light per capita. Like indoor, the, indoor lighting, like at night time, that kind of thing. Sorry, yeah. say that again. You mean like indoor lighting in the evening hours? Artificial lighting, yeah, artificial right. lighting. Yeah, because you could tell because they left, you know, fortunately for us and unfortunately for them, during the eruption, they left all their oil lamps on the floor. So we knew how many lamps they had in a household. And we used to think that, or I used to think that you'd have a lamp for a long time, but you didn't because the oil would heat up and the lamp would expand and the handle would break. So poor people didn't buy like really old oil lamps because that didn't happen. So they literally had like a year lifespan, which is really interesting. You think, oh, okay, that's, that's, they didn't realize that. They even calculated like the amphora they needed to transport the, the oil. So I used to think, again, they would recycle it, but they didn't because the amphora would go, the oil inside the amphora would go rancid. And so like even if they tried to, scrape it and still go around it so they couldn't reuse it which is why the Colosseum has so much amphora at the foundation so it's just really interesting to look at you know, the calculations of these things and like the olive presses and things like that so that was that, the kind that, of information that, that, that I believe statistically zero percent of people know <laughs> it's, well yeah not many it's wild know that, but the daily no, but it's, mail it's, in super, the UK was it's super interesting because you know you read all these ancient texts about nighttime parties and you're thinking, how did they illuminate their indoor spaces? And you never learn about that, you know. But it's fascinating mm-hmm. to hear that actually they had more lighting than the uh, Eng- the pre-electricity English. So that's that's pretty awesome. Yeah, they did. It's because of policy, partly because things like in you know in that period of time, and well, Pompeii and Herculaneum was very uh, wealthy anyway. So it's not a, not across the board that wealthy. But we know, for example, that they ate better than people from Naples today based on the sewer in Herculaneum. So we know certain things. We also know people were vegetarian on purpose because of the origin fibers. And it's just really, really interesting because I was like, how did these people see the world? We were calculating things like, okay, in the temples, they would use like beeswax because of the smell. And then like the tallow would be for the normal candle, for the normal person. And we're looking at, we were looking at the festivals and how often they would use that lighting and things like that. So it was like really in depth. And then you calculate like things like in we had a candle tax in 1821 in in England, and so you knew how many candles were sold. You also had a window tax. So between the window tax and the candle tax, very poor people had no lighting. They're very deprived. So you we had to go through like court documents of doctors going, you know, very poor people have very have these deficiencies because they don't have any light in their home. Whereas in ancient Rome, it was like you cannot put a fence so high because it will block your neighbor's lighting. So it just tells you that. Not only about technology, but it's also about policy. So that was really interesting. But I'm really dying to ask you this question. I'm about sure. to ask you because 
I was sitting with Malcolm Schofield of Cambridge University yesterday, yep. actually. Uh -huh. And we were talking about people claiming in the 21st century, particularly now in the discourse, about my rights. I have a right not to be offended. I have a right to do this. I have a right to do the, the other. And we were just wondering, both of us, how the conversation would be different if we looked at obligations and duties. And considering this is your dissertation, I wanted to ask you, how would the discourse be different on, say, Twitter, if we didn't focus on what rights, quote unquote, that we had, and instead focus on our obligation and duties? So that's my, my first question to you. Wow, you're, you're not even doing a warm up. You're starting with, a, with a heavy punches here. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like we need to unpack this question into maybe 17 components before we can adequately uh, tackle it. But I mean, the, the first thing is, th this is a really interesting difference between how we see the world ethically and pre-modern people. And I think that rights in particular seems to be a British invention um, or discovery, depending on how you see it. Um, and I've always, I've often wondered why did this uh, rise of talk of rights come to being? And I think that, I mean, this is way beyond my expertise. So like, I'm sure academics would eat me alive at what I'm saying here, but you know, uh, just among this nice company, I'll, I'll venture to offer the idea that I think perhaps the notion of rights was facilitated into existence by peculiarities of Germanic languages, including English. Because if you think about it like this, the phrase, I have a right, if, if you didn't hear it a million times, it's grammatically weird because right is a, an adjective usually. And suddenly you're saying, I have a right. And, um, you know, and this historically seems to be related to claims, but who has, you know, the right claim to something, right? So there's all these weird peculiarities of, history and language that came into this um, framework that was really developed by British philosophers. Um, and I personally think philosophically, it doesn't, it has really severe problems. I don't, I'm not sure that rights as an ethical framework works. Um, so that's kind of my intro to beginning to answer your question, but um, Instead of just monologuing, I'll, I'll let you jump in if you want to jump in here, or you know. No, I, um, I, 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 uh, I agree with you. Uh, I find okay. it very strange that we suddenly seem to have. Oh, I have a natural right, as it were, to something. Or I have a God-given right to something. And it's like, well, how do you explain that other than just stating that, right? Outside of what we've just said, stating that you have a right. What is your foundation? What is your philosophical foundation for claiming such a right? And it's, and then you're on very shaky ground very shaky ground because it's very difficult for you to be able to say well, why why does somebody have a right and somebody else not have a right so you could have an example of why was it a right for heterosexual couples to marry but it wasn't a right for uh, homosexual couples to marry on what basis did that happen so i just find yeah i find it very uh european perhaps not completely british but germanic certainly with the british part there of this idea this notion that certain individuals, for very few reasons that you can say are logical, have these kind of rights, have an ability to do something or to prevent somebody else from doing something. And I think it is linked to uh, the British obsession with property, for example. A lot of rights come out of um, a property. And the thing that we were discussing yesterday was that when one gives a right, it is the powerful, the, those who are the most powerful giving something or conceding something to a person they deem to be less powerful, typically, not always, either themselves or somebody less powerful. And the idea I like about obligations and duty is that it gives the emphasis on the most powerful, powerful to do what they can, and they are best placed to do it. So when you give people rights, it's very strange because they have to claim them somehow. And it doesn't, again, the logic falls down. So I'll let you continue because I think we're in agreement. I just want to yeah. know how you would yeah, argue either way. A couple a couple more strange things about the way we talk about rights is number one, when people, when people say, you know, X, Y, or Z should be a right. It's like, well, mm -hmm. if rights are somehow facts of nature or facts of humanity, then why should something be a right? 
and why wasn't it before? Um, that's another philosophical problem that needs to be worked out. And um, now, so you, you kind of offered this dichotomy earlier of duties and obligations being an alternative framework to, um, you know, with which to dis discuss ethical questions as opposed to rights. And I just want to point out that there's also some strange things about how people in the English language talk about duties and obligations. And that is that the um, the term duty has to do with do, what's due to somebody. And, uh, you know, what you ought to do is what you owe as well, right? So there are these etymological links in English to owing. Um, and so I, I find that English philosophers and English speaking people in general, they have this intuition that duties have to do with what you owe to other people. And this was one of the big obstacles against my position in my book, where I claim that the ancients had a notion of duty because, you know, people would say, well, but the ancient Greek and Roman words that you're talking about don't have any notion of owing, right? But then again, right. we should, but we should remove ourselves from the English position for a second and look at, say, German, where, you know, Immanuel Kant is widely considered the pioneer of modern duty-based ethics. Some of, you, some of you even think of him as the inventor of the notion of moral duty. And yet his German word for duty, Pflicht, has no connection etymologically with um, owing. So I just want to point out that you know we shouldn't necessarily think of duties as things owed to people. They could also be things that we just should do. And then the question is, well, what, where does that obligation come from? And then we can get in, that's another rabbit hole we can dive into. So, so I just wanted to lay out those two problems with both sides of this dichotomy that you um, sketched out. Um, can I can I throw yeah. something in here then? Because yeah. I, I mean, to me, uh, listen, I have nothing academically to add to this conversation. But uh, there, there was an interesting uh, kind of idea that I heard yesterday. I was listening to a conversation with, uh, I believe his name is Michael Schellenberger. He's running for uh, uh, governor of San Francisco, I believe. Uh, and he quoted from Viktor Frankl, who apparently said, so, sorry, I'm so many lines removed here, but apparently he said something like, America, you know, they have the Statue of Liberty, but what they should have done is they should have also had the Statue of Responsibility because they've only got one side of that. And to me, it seems like it is, is a duty or an obligation, not perhaps uh, something that is required of you uh, in response to the receiving of a, a certain right or a certain benefit is there is should that be sort of like a, a balance like yes we do have these certain rights for individuals but on the flip side of that what is your duty to your nation and I think that perhaps one of the major reasons why Jordan Peterson had such a massive upswell in his career is because he came out there and he was like hang on we've talked about rights for way 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 too long without having the balanced conversation of or here's your responsibility or your duty to your nation, to your people as a result of receiving those rights. A am I on the right track here? How do you see that? Uh, that's the very sort of rights-based counter point. As a, like the Stoics will talk about appropriate action and what is the appropriate thing to do. It's not about what is owed. Like mm. if you take responsibility from some aspects of John Pearson, it's like, something is owed to someone for a reason, as opposed to just getting what is owed to you or trying to. Stokes would say things like, is it appropriate? Is that a way that you're cultivating your character? It doesn't, the other persons, they're not irrelevant because we are part of the cosmopolis, but it, the, the, the reason for me behaving a certain way is not because you're owed something or I should give you something out of the sense of duty. It's because it is the appropriate thing to do. If I'm the sage, it is the virtuous thing to do. Well, let, let me ask one thing there then, um, and then perhaps I'll, I'll try and uh, pull this conversation back to ancient Greece and Rome. <laughs> but, um, but uh, okay, we'll see one benefit I see of, uh, the benefit I see of having, say, for example, a nation under God, is it's like because the highest person in that government always has something above them that they need to answer to, right? And I think that that's important. And even in the same way, if it's only about what's appropriate 
actually, well, who gets to decide that? I mean, if you've got a tyrant and that, well, this is appropriate. Well, doesn't it help to then, have, well, no, no, hang on. We have these God-given rights and that's what we're debating about. And, and, and to, to me, do you see what I'm trying to say there? Like who, who gets well, to decide the in the, in the, in the, the appropriate politics? Action, the appropriate action is the living according to nature. And the, I remember saying this before, people always get confused at this. It's we decide. Do you remember when we talked about the Socratic dialectic? That you and I, if we and the other people that are in the cosmos, we decide collectively. And it's living according to one's nature. But I'll let Jack, because Jack's the uh, Jack weigh in here, and I'll stop. So Jack, can you answer Simon's question, please? Well, see, responsibility is another really problematic concept. You know, I um, I once took this seminar at Princeton with this famous moral theorist and it was called moral moral responsibility and um the first few weeks was kind of just define what that means what does responsibility mean and honestly there was no good way to do it and so the professor just said so you know what i'm just going to i'm just going to use the concept of blameworthiness so to me the, the, the focus I want to make is, you know, that if you're blameworthy for something, if you're potentially blamable for something, then you are responsible for that. So he basically just like took another word and rolled with that. And this is not to, you know, diss on him because I think that reveals another problem. Like in the modern world, we are using these words that we've inherited and each word is built on a previous word, which is built on a previous word. And often like, these words have gone through like three or four borrowings or developments without there being a an examination of whether that word still corresponds to something tangible. And I think that's the case with these words like rights, responsibility, and obligations are all words that have gone through um, Christian theology. They've gone through Greco-Roman and then medieval and then early modern philosophy. They've accumulated tons of baggage and um, so, <laughs> I mean, my approach is always um, to look at like, to think what would an ancient Greek or Roman have, how would they have expressed these ideas? And they didn't have these fancy words. They had very simple words. And that's uh, a test. According to that test, we would have to dr drastically simplify our language to even begin to answer these questions. So mm -hmm. I'm just throwing that as a can of worms. It's not really a... Um, well, it's also a good segue yeah. into ancient Greece and Rome, right? So, you know, you, you bring up this, obviously you've done a lot of your work on this concept of duty, which uh, you contend uh, was the, the, basically the invention of the Stoics. Uh, how, do you, how do you think the term duty uh, or even just the way that they debated words uh, in ancient Greece stacks up against something like responsibility or, or even, uh, you know, obligation? Um, uh, you know, and even putting that into terms with rights, like what, what what would the ancient Greeks have thought about this idea of rights, for example? Good question. Um, <laughs> so to, to do this, this is what I call the, the Reggie Foster test. Reggie Foster was an American priest who was the Latin, the chief Latinist of the Vatican for 40 years under like four different popes, probably the best Latin speaker and writer in the world for several decades. Um, and he used to say, you know, if you can't say it in Latin, you know, it's BS. <laughs> and um, so this, I've often wondered, how would ancients, ancient Greeks and Romans describe what we call rights? And I'm not sure I have the answer, but one possibility is they could say that they are, you know, protected privileges or protected prerogatives. I don't think we like to hear that because that undercuts the whole notion that they might be God given if they're, if they have, if they're if the word privilege or prerogative somehow um, implies that it's not, it's, it's like something, it's like fluff, you know, it's not some core aspect of our being, which the term rights does indicate. So I think um, potentially, a, you know, a Greek or Roman would struggle to find a way to say what we call a right and therefore conclude that uh, it was a suspicious concept. Mm. Mm. I, 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 have, I have to ask you just in response to something you said there. 
why would that priest whose name I can't remember, but uh, mm-hmm. why would he say something like, if, if you can't say it in Latin, uh, then it's, then it's BS. I, I want to know, like, what is it about that language and how it was developed and that, that, that makes it so fundamental to our understanding? Sure. Well, first of all, lest that I get in trouble, that's my paraphrase of what he used yeah, to say. But, yeah. you know, he, so he, you know, he would get these letters from these cardinals, um, you know, high ranking, ultra powerful members of the Catholic church. And they would send him speeches that they'd written in French or German or Spanish or English and ask him to translate them into Latin. And, and now I'm trying to get as close to his words as possible. As far as I can remember, he, he, you know, he said, they would write things like, uh, we are approaching a new horizon where, you know, the intersection of hope and prosperity will lead to, you know, all these like abstract florid words. And he, he would reply to them saying, I can't try and translate this because it's nonsense. Mm-hmm. And he says, you know, you're not, Latin doesn't let you do that. Latin, all these modern European languages, again, they've inherited so many philosophical, theological, abstract words over the millennia. And they've grown their abstract vocabulary so much that you can now kind of get away with stringing together abstractions and sounding Perfect. really good and smart. And Latin just doesn't let you do that. It's such a bare bones, practical, tangible, uh, tangible language. So you really got to break things down. Um, and, and then people would say, yeah, but like Latin can't express modern philosophy. Like, how would you say somebody actually asked him this, I think for a, a major publication in the U S said, how would you say the full gamut of existential options? And Reggie replied, well, first of all, I wouldn't because it's a stupid sentence, but if I really had to, I would say omnia quae fieri possunt, which literally means all things which can come to be. Now think of how much simpler all things which can come to be is than the full gamut of existential options. You know, Mm. so. (laughs) Wow, this guy sounds like an asshole, but an amazing person. (laughs) <laughs> he, he, he made a, he made a lot of enemies in in Rome. <laughs> no, but it, yeah, I think I I always allow people a certain leeway when they are so clearly an absolute genius and top of their field in these sorts of things because it's like listen to these people like they have something important to say, um, and perhaps they won't always say it in a nice way, but um, but it's fun anyway. I love that. I, I, I want to kind of yeah go back into this ancient Greek period and I want to ask you uh, specifically about the religious and philosophical landscape of the time because my understanding so far is very limited but <clears throat> what I do understand I think is that it was a real melting pot where there was no real lines drawn between the religious and the philosophical and the political it was all in the soup together in a sense and I just wanted to know from you, uh, yeah, what was that philosophical, political, you know, theological landscape at that time like? What did it look like? Well, I think it's it was very similar to our world today hmm. in the following sense. Um, when we go to the movies and we see something like Interstellar, which is a horrible movie, but it's amazing in certain ways. I mean, it's, you know, the... It's, it has phenomenal actors. Its production value is amazing. The effects are incredible. The science that went into it isn't, you know, they had Kip Thorne, a Caltech expert on black holes, consult with them on how to portray, um, you know, the, the black hole and the time dilation, all that kind of stuff. So you can see how this one movie, uh, if archaeologists discovered it in 2000 years, would show a huge amount of stuff about our culture. It would show us our, our you know, certain aspects of our science, of our, of our philosophy, of our uh, entertainment industry, of our technology and making effects, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, the, the equivalent of that for ancient Athens was the theater. And, you know, people think of it as just, okay, it's like an amphitheater in the center of town. You go and you see people dance around and pretend to be um, Odysseus. Well, no, actually, you need to think of it in a similar way as the as Hollywood today, because Athens is 
is a hub. It's probably the main hub of, um, it's the main hub of a network of 1000 ancient Greek city-states that dot the coast of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea from Spain to what's now Georgia, the country of Georgia. And these thousand independent city-states, they're all speaking the same language. They all produce music and culture and stories and everything. And, and because of this incredible network of communication, they're all influencing each other. And all of these ideas can be seen as like traveling down these nerves, nerve cells, which, which are the shipping lanes, and all reaching Athens, where the brightest creative minds use those ideas to create these spectacular performances on the Athenian stage. And so the Athenian theater and the productions that were put on there with incredible special effects and everything, um, they incorporate philosophical theological, technological, cultural, and political ideas from this huge network of states. And so it's really, um, there's nothing else like it until the modern period. The Romans didn't have it, that that network was gone. I mean, it, you know, just, it was a different political system. So I think there is nothing like the Athenian theater until modern, you know, maybe modern Europe, um, or maybe I think in the East, there were some earlier examples um, you know, in what we, in the European middle ages, but, uh, yeah, so I would say it's, it's similar to, um, to our world in many ways. Mm. And, and just that, that information superhighway that all comes together in, in these, these plays in, in Athens, I've heard you talk about the, uh, the Dionysian festivals and how they would, uh, you know, even the, at, during that time, they were, you know, even placing the greatest philosophers like Socrates into their plays and imitating him. And then uh, these, these festivals where they would be drinking their wine and then carrying the actors and the actresses out through the streets and, you know, partying afterwards. It, it sounds like this was, well, firstly, that's way better than an experience of going to a movie today. <laughs> that sounds way <laughs> better, but uh, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that Dionysian element of, of the, uh, of, of the plays that they would put on. Yeah, so that's the the Dionysian element is it showcases what you were saying earlier about how the religious there were less distinct boundaries um, between spheres that we think of as separate back then, like the the religious world and the entertainment world and the political world all blended together in this in the festivals like the Great Dionysia where a lot of these plays were were performed, and that's the feature that scholarship focuses on like most scholarship looks at the cult of Dion the cult of Dionysus and um how his persona as this shape-shifting gender defying um uh, god of euphoria and ecstasy and irrationality affected that festival um what I what I kind of the picture I gave earlier about this network that's a more historical, technological approach to the same phenomenon. So, okay, and uh, Kai, if you want to jump in, I just have one more quick question here, and then I'm going to throw it over to you. Is I I really haven't looked into this as much as I should have, and so I probably could know with a quick Wikipedia search, but. Um, you, you mentioned these city states. I, I actually don't currently understand how the the governmental structures uh, or even the border divides worked in ancient Greece. So was this more of like a, a just really localized smaller cities everywhere that had their own governmental structures, or was it all still part of the one nation? I I, I don't I don't know anything about that. That's the Kai, right? Oh no! So that that was to you. Sorry. Oh, that was to me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, the this ecosystem of city states uh, is another kind of unique product of unique social historical circumstances. Okay. So, um, I have this hunch or theory that people form the smallest political groups they can that are that are you know strong enough to 
to be self-sufficient. You know, like people like to have small political groups. Um, it takes a lot of work to maintain an empire. And if you convince part of an empire that they can break off and be independent and safe, they will often do that, right? So, uh, so the Greeks are expanding demographically like crazy after the Bronze Age collapsed, at least a few centuries after the Bronze Age collapsed. There are no huge empires around. And so they're able to kind of form these small political units. And here's the, the kind of unique historical feature here. You know, for, for the past thousand years or even more, we think of the Mediterranean Sea as a dividing feature, a feature that divides Europe from Africa. It often, it, for a long time, it divided Christendom from the world of Islam. Um, back then, Mediterranean was a connecting feature. You know, like uh, the inhabitants of Southern Spain and what's now Southern Spain and France and Italy had much more in common with the inhabitants of what's now Tunisia and Algeria than they did with people a hundred miles north. You know, so the Mediterranean is this incredible connecting geographic feature. And the Greeks and other peoples like the Phoenicians and Etruscans and Italic peoples, they are able to form these small coastal towns. And as long as they have a good port and fortifications, they are unassailable by even huge marauding barbarian hordes, you know, like this is, this is the thing. So this is before siege technology. That's the key thing. As long as you could put up a strong wall and you had access to the sea, you were safe. And so that means that they, that these peoples, the Greeks and the Etruscans and the Phoenicians, they could copy paste this tiny little city state model at, like until the Mediterranean ran out of space, <laughs> which is why they filled up the entire North African Southern European and Black Sea coast with this same like copy pasted uh, institution of the city state. Mm. And so that, and then now during the time of Philip and Alexander and then the Romans, of course, siege technology finally caught up with wall technology and was able to, you know, ram through any wall. So <laughs> that's one of the reasons why the city state ceased to be possible. Uh, and then you kind of get a revival a little bit in Italy in the Middle Ages with like Venice and uh, and Ravenna and Genoa, but and Venice did have you know uh, water around it, and Ravenna before that had water around it, uh, but you never had that historical situation where you know having a wall and a port was enough. That was that was like this brief historical window when that was possible, and then this institution just exploded all over the Mediterranean. Mm. Wow. So it was kind of like this, this governmental technology that was purely based around our ability to have this wall and for it to not be penetrated, but then other technologies caught up. Wow. This is the, this is the story of eternity, right? <laughs> is, is we're always, we're always trying to figure out how we balance that, you know, the new technology coming along with what is currently keeping us safe. Um, interesting to think about the walled garden in that way as well. Are we creating a city state of the metaverse um that's for well, another maybe, time maybe you should maybe you should clarify that your walled garden has a port because without a port you're, yes. uh, <laughs> you're, you're, whatever you have the best walls will not keep you safe what is our port mm, perhaps it's right here this information <laughs> source coming in right now uh kai do you want to jump in with any questions there yes uh jack given that you've just helpfully clarify to the audience about city-states. Could you explain to them Zeno's parts of aspects of Zeno's Republic and his ideas within that in relation to the historical information you've just given very nicely? Well, I mean, as you know, Zeno's Republic has not survived. So there's a few people in the world who have looked at all the fragments and can reconstruct it and I, you're probably better qualified than I am to talk about that but are you are you thinking of the idea of the cosmopolis in particular or yes, you know yeah because okay. people get confused about what what the historical understanding of, of the ancient understanding states of the sort of city city state and why they're significant historically for the cosmopolis but I just would like you to mm -hmm. share your ideas yeah I mean this is you know we Simon and I talked about this briefly in an earlier conversation on the walled garden, where um, again, up and as long as this 
copy pasteable model of the city state with big walls and a nice port was viable. Um, Greek ethics, which grew up in this ecosystem, was all about you know finding your place in the in the polis in the city state. When the city state ceased to be a viable model after Alexander the Great, in large part because of siege technology and the emergence of mega states that swallowed up the small city states, the old philosophies of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle that were all about your political virtue no longer made sense in this in these huge new uh, empires. And so my like in a word, my my explanation is that you know Zeno took the concept of the polis and he extended it to the whole universe or what the Greeks thought of as the universe and said, okay, this is your new polis. Your new polis is the whole world. Think of the of the antipodes, the people on the other side of the globe whose feet are opposite to your feet. <laughs> Think of them as your fellow citizens in the cosmic order and then kind of frame your morality around that view of the cosmic city. Is that your interpretation, uh, more or less? Yeah, because he talks, yeah. I mean, when the Republic people think, I know we only have fragments, and they often think that, oh, he's talking about the ideal world. And really, he's talking about the ideal city. Uh, and people forget, that historically, the idea of the wealth that we have today is something that just would never have occurred to them. I did like the way that you discussed, like the, the Mediterranean being a connection, how we uh, in the modern world have created boundaries out of um, water bodies. And the same holds true, which is why I'm being bad. We talk about Spherus, who's from the uh, Ukrainian area. And you think, what has Ukraine got to do with Greece? You think it was only a little, well, a relatively small body of water that separates. So we talk about like the whispers of Aspens like drifting across to him and him going, he going, oh, I need to leave and I need to go to, you know, find you know, someone like Zeno. So I think it's wonderful that you've just highlighted to the audience how we can often see boundaries, whereas before there were opportunities and, and vice versa, right? Yep. So I think this is a very powerful way of saying, well, the way that we've carved it up in you know, um, the me medieval and sort of later period of a river was a dividing, like in the UK, you have one side of the river and the other side of the river. And that's a very like a, a division, even today. Like when I was uh, in Lisbon, living in Lisbon, they would say things like there's a river in, in Lisbon and there's a statue of Jesus. They're kind of it's much more than the one in Brazil. And they say, you know, the poor people live on one side of the river and they say, oh, they're so, they're so, they've suffered so much that even Jesus has turned the, his back on them. Right. Even that, <laughs> kind of, even that is used yeah, now yeah. to sort of highlight distinction between those who, who are wealthy enough to live in. Lisbon as opposed to the neighboring area that isn't quite Lisbon but might like to be. So it's quite interesting that even now we see rivers um, as things that separate us, that distinguish us socially and economically, whereas before they really were the lifeline, you know, they were how to, from traveling, your, um, the ability to eat and, and drink well, as like we said earlier, Herculaneum and Pompeii were very wealthy. They ate better than people from Naples today. Why? Because of, because of the fertile land provided by volcanic um, soil and also the ports. People forget about the importance of these things. So I'm just really grateful to you, Jack, that you've highlighted these concepts of, again, bring, seeing something that brings us together. In the straight position, every, you know, there's no division, really. It's, everything can be used to bring us together. Everything can be used to to help us work towards the, the cosmopolis. And I, I think that Zeno's Republic or the very few fragments that we have highlight that. Things like, you know, one does not need to, uh, one does not need a, to have wives really, because that's mm. what, that's distinguishing, that's separating a person from the community in one way by um, gaining some sort of ownership, quote unquote, um, on that person. And the same as property, they're very much like, do we need private property? Do we need things that distinguish ourselves from anybody else up beyond what is the only thing that matters is being, being virtue? But I do want to go back to my original question because I know that I made it difficult for you. So if you don't have to answer it because it is a challenging question. Do you think that we, if we did talk about things like duties, if we did talk about the model that you've highlighted, that concepts that come from that model, a simpler model, do you think that the contemporary discourse would be a nicer place? I mean, I'm thinking about the 
the the Latin expert. I think he would be excellent on Twitter because he could say everything in like a very short, concise uh, manner. Do you think if we return to a simpler way of structuring our our arguments that we would get on better in the, in the, on social media, for example? Do you think that that was these days take away rather than provide a meaning? Yes, you know, you just gave me this idea. Like, what if we could channel Reggie Foster's persona into an artificial intelligence algorithm that <laughs> that gives you feedback on your tweet before you tweet it? It's like, you know, <laughs> it's like his face pops up. It's like, caution. It looks like you're stringing together abstract nouns in a manner that doesn't actually make tangible sense. Consider revising your argument. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think you're right. I mean, I don't actually... I, I think the what's hinted at in your question uh, is right. I mean, if we, um, I think if we, if we act, how do I put this? I think if we used the moral framework of duties more than we do, it would make for a more civil world, absolutely, a more constructive world. Um, because at the heart, you know, what what is the fundamental principle of duty? It's that we're all in this together, that we're all parts of a whole, that we are all, um, we should all cooperate towards some end. And so it's really, if we had that view, we wouldn't dehumanize others. We wouldn't um, see others as our enemies when we can find ways of seeing them as, as our potential allies in, again, in a better world. Um, it's the whole Christian principle of, of uh, you know, love thy enemy and turn the other cheek. I, I think those are not just religious pronouncements of a guru. Those are hard-won insights from this same Mediterranean ecosystem that were won after civil wars destroyed hundreds and hundreds of city-states. And people finally realized, okay, this is not working. We need a we need a better moral framework. We need to extend our notion of the polis more than to just our friends and family and faction. And we need to think of even strangers as people that we work together for a higher end. And so, yeah, I think that would do a lot of healing in the world if we could adopt that. But that's a big challenge. Mm. Is isn't this some, okay? This is cool because we're kind of doing a segue into what I wanted to ask you about, which is collapse you know I, I sent you an email <clears throat> recently <laughs> saying hey you know if we were to put together like a world garden international summit uh, and you were to do some sort of talk I would really want you to talk about the signs of collapse and look at our world at the moment there are there are a lot of things that we look around and we can think well, look if you just walk out and you go to your local cafe perhaps nothing's happening but uh, it certainly appears that there's a lot of major challenges that we're going through today that are really uh, forming cracks in the foundation of our culture. Uh, I, I, I think that that's pretty reasonable to say. Uh, and so going back to ancient Greece and Rome, you know, obviously these are, these are um, societies that fell away and there were certain signs. And what you're talking about there is that people had these hard won insights, really interesting way to put it of just looking at the world around them and seeing what works, what doesn't. Now, I'm guessing that this relates to this idea of natural law, that what we're always trying to do really as, as philosophers is trying to figure out what, what the hell is the natural law that's going on around us so that we can interface with reality uh, perhaps more successfully, uh, whatever that would mean. Um, but I, I, I guess I wanted to know, you said that uh, duty is in a sense this idea that we are all <clears throat> sorry parts of a whole right and that we we have this duty to work together with each other in a way that um allows that to be a harmonious whole to me when i hear you say that i'm thinking whole capital w as in god right but do you think that it has to be theological uh, theologically interpreted like how, how do you how do you justify something like duty without a capital W whole or God that we are a part of as almost like an organism of the body of God, you might say. Fantastic question. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
No, really, really interesting. Um, I, I thought about this for a long time. And I think that if you look at, you know, the, all of the philosophers that were into duty, okay, like all the Stoics and Kant, they all had a notion of this, you know, one benevolent rational deity, okay? And, and actually there, there, was a, there was an attempt to update Stoics for the 21st century or 20th century, maybe it was 20th still, um, and kind of build a modern Stoic theory without God. And I'm not, you know, I'm not sure it works. I think maybe you need God ultimately. Um, but so, so I think that this kind of reliance on God at a metaphysical level uh, might be the Achilles heel of, or I, actually <laughs> in a previous conversation, I, I, I talked about a different Achilles heel, so I shouldn't do that. But it might be one of the fatal flaws of stoicism maybe it's um that it has kind of god in the foundation of its thinking and i'm wondering is it possible to construct a duty system without god and this is a topic i actually want to explore in the future um in my research in my podcast so i don't really have you know the best answer for you yet but i think that in practice people can people can you know learn about duty and think about duty and perform their duties and feel a kind of natural inclination to duty without thinking about God. But I think that if you want to ground it philosophically and you keep asking the why, yeah, but why should you do this? Yeah. But why does that matter? Yeah. But why is that important? Okay. But like, why is that really true? When you play the four-year-old game of why, 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 why you need to land somewhere. And that's the role that the benevolent rational divinity plays in all these duty systems and i feel like if you pull that out most people might not notice it but the philosophers who want to find the grounding of ideas will notice it and that's a a challenge maybe for the 21st century is is there a way to ground a obligations-based moral framework without resorting to a benevolent rational deity and i'm not sure that's possible hmm. well if i can yeah let me throw something back here at you because to me, it seems like um, you might be coming from this, uh, coming at this from the perspective of um, it would be desirable to you to be able to find a way to to find duty without God. I think Kai and I both would come at it from the perspective of what, what the hell is wrong with this idea of God? <laughs> like, like all roads do lead back to that. And I think we can always think about it on different levels because there's no one way to talk about this idea of God. Um, uh, to me, the the most fundamental way that I like to speak about it is there has to be the experience there of being brought into this this massive web of uh, <laughs> um, uh, oh gosh, you, you know your your Latin friend would 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 kill me by <laughs> just trying to get through this sentence, you know, trying to talk, but to me, there's the experiential language that we use when we're we're talking about God. But then there's also just the grammatical, which I think is somewhat what we're talking about here, where it's almost like the Greeks may have perhaps said, uh, <laughs> it's just bad grammar if you don't understand God, because <laughs> it's like, you know, you follow these words and these sentences correctly, and all of a sudden you see that they do lead back to, okay, there needs to be this fundamental structure that holds all of this up. And without that, I think that Kai, maybe I'll bring you in here quickly. And then Ashley's raised his hand. So we should dive into a bit of a Q and A section as well, but Kai, maybe you could talk better about uh, this idea of it almost just being a matter of correct grammar for, for the Greeks and maybe push back a bit. I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, I was speaking and then Malcolm and I spoke about this yesterday and James Warren, who's also at Cambridge uh, and I spoke about it this uh, last Friday and Jack is right in the sense that if stoicism has a fatal flaw it may well be that you need God the issue that you then have is that stoicism and that is this that is a squarely position that stoicism without God stoic ethics doesn't make sense so one thing is like if we remove God if we pull out the thing it's literally pulling out like you said, a sentence that no longer can make sense because you've just removed the verb, right? You've just removed the fundamental thing that tells you something about what a person is doing. 
So I, I do see that sense of like the structure of Stoicism from a scholarly argument. I've never met any scholar who said anything different requires God, right? So this is why I've always pushed back on Chris Fisher as well, saying that you can't have a Stoicism without God. Now, that doesn't mean that Stoicism is valid. That's a, diff that's a different debate entirely. But Stoicism is definitely invalid in terms of the ethics with, without the idea of a benevolent God. The whole of the ethics rests upon that, which is why when uh, Lawrence Becker, and he called to be fair to Lawrence, uh, he said it was a new Stoicism. He, he's talking about living according to facts. And you know, I, well, you and I have debated these things about saying, well, which fact do you want to live according to? Because sometimes you have two facts that are, that you've got to got you know you've got contradictory things going on like i told i always say okay i burn a fossil fuel because i got to get my kids to school so i'm ruining the planet but if i don't get my kids to school i'm ruining my kids education which fact is more important i can't decide based on those facts but i do think jack is, is right and i would perhaps call it the achilles heel of stoicism that it requires necessarily the divine the divine reason the spark right i don't can see I how you can get out yeah. I, okay, okay. Here's, here's my pushback there. Because when you say that it's the Achilles heel of Stoicism, to me, that implies that what you believe is that it would almost be better if Stoicism didn't have to rely on, on, on God. That's an academic and see, argument, not my argument. But, but see, that also That's not my position. That That's not my position. In order for it to be an academically sound philosophy, then it needs to not have that foundation of God. Whereas some, a theologian might turn around and say, hang on, hang on. That's Stoicism's biggest strength. The big weakness of our modern interpretation of Agreed. reality is that it doesn't have God. You know, so it's 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 that's my position. Yeah. However, from an academic framing, from a scholarly academic framing, from uh, in the academic world, that when you're not in the theology department, you are very you find this to be a nuisance. Again, it's not my position, which is why things like. I have been warned by scholars to say why, you know, when we wrote the piece about, Leo and I wrote the piece about Stoic theology the, the, and how it was useful, the key scholars were saying, are you sure you want to write this? So because of the way that academia is funded and the way it's structured, so this is a, you know, there are deep criticisms that I have. And so, yes, I have exactly the same position that I would not call it an Achilles heel. But from, if you're looking at it from a purely philosophical objective dry sort of thing you would definitely say that it is the Achilles heel because as James Warren says to me you have to tie yourself in knots right you have to tie yourself in certain ways which you are there is a lack of degrees of freedom as a philosopher when you make an argument so we were talking about well you know there's no animal welfare in stoicism so he said would you agree with us yes I can't argue an animal welfare case in stoicism because there's no there's no place to put my coat. There's no peg to place my coat upon. It would just fall on the floor because that strokes don't provide that. Now, I don't have an issue with that. But academically speaking, it, it lacks the rigor that some philosophers would like. And I would agree with you. I'd say the greatest strength for me is the objectivity of, of God. Absolutely. But that is not a common academic argument. Go on, Jack. Well, yeah, let's let Jack have the last yeah. word in this and then we're going to open it up to Q&A here. Um, thanks for being patient, Ashley, man. So that, I mean, you, you guys really raised a lot of interesting points. Um, trying to, I had a thought. Um, so first of all, I want to kind of correct what I said a little bit. Um, because I also, when I was talking about the Achilles heel or the, the flaw of stoicism, I, I didn't mean that as a personal assessment, but as what the modern secular academic establishment would see. Mm. And I just want to say that maybe what I should have said is not that stoicism requires God, but all ethics might require God. And I'm not sure there is any ethical system that's ever been proposed that's totally secular that actually works. Um, and when I look at the great moral thinkers that I find incredibly uh, thought provoking from Plato to Dostoevsky, they all seem to think that you, you really need God to fill in your ethics. I mean, this is what the brothers Karamazov was about. You know, uh, one of the brothers, um, Ivan, he wants to be moral. He wants to have a moral framework that's secular and he goes mad. And it's only Alyosha who, who, who has the grounding in the faith 
actually preserves his sanity. Um, I mean, these, this is like, you know, a huge topic, which I would love to talk to you guys yeah. more about, but yeah, I just, I just wanted to highlight that it's not just stoicism. It's an, a problem throughout ethics that um, you, you run into problems when you get rid of uh, a notion of a divinity. Mm. And is it a problem yes, or is it an opportunity? <laughs> it's a startup opportunity. <laughs> yeah, should we, um, should we have perhaps open this up? Uh, Jack, I, I really want to thank yeah. you, man. This has been such a great conversation so far. And I'm sure Ashley's got a question that's going to, you know, throw you in a loop in another direction <laughs> as well. So Ash, jump in, man. You've been listening to the Walled Garden Podcast. If you'd like to attend any of our free meetups and events, or if you'd like to get one-on-one mentoring with either Sharon LaBelle, Kai Whiting, or myself, just go to thewalledgarden.com. But for now, don't forget to nourish those gardens in your mind.